Hi, everybody. My name uh, is Georgie Benardete. I am the CEO of the Impact Investing Marketplace Alliance 17. And it's such a pleasure to have today Susan Graham and Simon uh, Mulcahy, uh, who are joining us uh, to discuss everything about innovation, systems changing, and what does it take to scale uh, the SDGs? So we have a very um, short and but exciting uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so we'll get started um, with both Simon and Susan um, spending time first to you know, introduce yourselves from your perspective and also share um, your perspective and the way you define um, uh, the word uh, innovation. And thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. Shall I, shall I kick it off? <laughs> sure. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank, thanks, obviously, for, for having us here. And um, Simon, I look forward to having, having a good discussion. Uh, as, as some background, um, the CEO of Dendra Systems, and we really started because of a challenge. Um, a challenge that was unacceptable for us to, to, to just walk past. Uh, and that for us is increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere year on year and a loss of biodiversity 10 times higher than it's been in the last 10 million years. Um, and, you know, there are very few challenges in this world which have their own uh, deadline, their own clock. We often have to artificially create that deadline. We, we call it a war on something, a war on cancer. Um, to create that deadline. And, and here we've been given one <laughs> to, for, the, for the whole of the world to take up uh, as, as an innovation challenge. And that's the environment talking to us um, and setting that deadline. So that's what, we, that's what we've taken on at Dendra Systems and, uh, and spend all our energy uh, coming up with solutions for it. And then uh, <clears throat> Simon, Simon Mulcahy, the Chief Innovation Officer at Salesforce. And uh, for those of you who don't know Salesforce, it's... Um, 21 year old company now barely just out of being a teenager and um the fastest fastest growing enterprise software company and really our job is to bring customers and their um and the com companies and their customers together so imagine creating a, a single source of truth around your customers and enabling you to engage them and and for us innovation is is actually a value that we have it's, it's one of the core values of salesforce so there's innovation happening at every level um and we like to think of it much more in the context of kind of applied innovation, how you use technology in the context of creating real meaningful outcomes. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Simon. So, you know, as I was preparing for the for this session, I found I'm here in Seattle right now. There is around 1,175 books with the word innovate. Uh, so it, it'd be tempting to think uh, like Harvard Business School things that we should not use that word. And however, Susan, from your perspective, you definitely understand the power of innovation, not just, uh, you know, as an innovation in technology for the sake of it, or innovation at the service of the world. And also one thing uh, to remind ourselves, you and your company were chosen one of the top three, um, you know, ideas and, and realities uh, in support of Uplink's One Trillion Tree Challenge. So I think what's interesting for me is to understand what was the thought process by which you were able to finally, you know, to finally, you know, figure out a way to get restoration of ecosystems done right in a way that we could get to that deadline that you so well described. Yeah. Do you know, it's interesting. I, I feel like I'm almost a mix between two people. Uh, I'm someone who's incredibly impatient. And, and a lot of the people who are in our team have that, uh, that lack of patience, that sense of urgency in everything that we do. And um, one of my favorite quotes from Tom Chi uh, is doing is the best kind of thinking. And so we've got that kind of a attitude. And then that has actually collided with uh, what I picked up from Oxford when I did my PhD there which is when you come up with an idea and you've got that urgency, uh, we were very much encouraged to, you know, go sit under a tree for a while and just think about that, <laughs> um, which is obviously in complete contrast to, to getting something done and um, executing. But it's so important to reflect on the why and reflect on the problem because 
as you said, there's, there's been lots of innovation on Earth. Um, and sometimes we've innovated in the right direction. We've spent, you know, years and millions of people's lives and dedication towards innovating something. And then perhaps we've reflected and said, did we go in the right direction? We've gone in that direction, but did we go in the right direction? And so when I think about specifically around carbon and obviously the problem we're tackling around restoring biodiverse natural ecosystems is much more than carbon. But when we look at carbon, we have a carbon cycle. And at the moment, we're not in a carbon cycle, we're on a carbon path. It's as if we've, uh, we've set ourselves in motion on, on this path that's not sustainable and we need to get back down uh, to a state to, to be back in a, in a carbon cycle. And so it is about asking this question, what problem are we solving and are we creating another problem for the future? And that's why we take a, a holistic approach to say we're not just solving for carbon dioxide, because if we were, we might plant monocultures over the whole earth. How terrible would that be if we just destroy the world's ecosystems and the potential for, for biodiversity on earth because of solving one just in its own little discrete mm -hmm. corner. Uh, so we very much take a holistic approach to say, there's a better way of doing this. We can actually solve multiple challenges all at once. If, if we can just, uh, you know, find the solutions and work with the right partners uh, to, to solve the bigger problem so that when we reflect and sit under a tree, we can be happy about what we've seen, but we can go fast uh, and, and solve those problems. Thank you so much. No, I'm a neuroscience uh, geek and uh, neuroscience support your idea of pausing before you start. So, and that's where the best ideas seem to come out. Um, it, Simon, I love uh, what, you know, she's uh, mentioning of kind of thinking about innovation in the right direction, right? And once again, about not just sake of it, but um, what are the elements that ensure that innovation is indeed going into the right direction? I understand from our conversations uh, in Salesforce that you have thought about this and that you have a very specific process by which you know, the full company, all of the employees, the value system and the understanding of why you're doing um, innovation makes sure um, that, that the results are positive, viable and, and, and bring success to, to your clients. Um, could you discuss a little bit about that process? Yeah, so we have a, a, a process which is effectively how we ensure that everybody <clears throat> in the company is aligned. It's um, what we call our V2 mom, and I'll, I'll, I'll break that down in a, in a minute. I think it's maybe worthwhile just pausing though first and, and, and talking a little bit of kind of to follow on from what Susan was saying. In order to have, in order to innovate, you kind of need to be really, really clear on what you're trying to achieve. And, and I think all too often people innovate thinking that all they're doing is improving the system that they had before them. It's an incremental um, style of innovation. That's fine. But all you're going to ever do then is you're leaning on the behavior of the past, the thinking of the past. And if you look at the world that we live in today, much of the world that we live in, we've accepted um, but the people who shaped it are dead, have been dead for a long, long time. And we just continue to absorb their thinking as if it's, it's, it's it, it, immutable and we shouldn't change it. So actually a lot of innovation is really about, has to be now, not about translating um, what they did into a modern sense, but actually pausing and thinking about how you might, with a beginner's mind, look at, um, at the problem. And that for us is step one, it's a beginner's mind. And if you don't have that beginner's mind, all you're gonna do is basically just pick up where everybody left off and haul it like whatever. You're gonna turn the wing nut a couple of cranks to the right, a couple of squirts of oil is the best you can do with any system. That's not good enough in a world where change is accelerating. So even a system that I'll explain to you is irrelevant if you're just incrementally approaching it. And that does mean the beginner's mind is fundamentally important. How are you really, really looking at, at the world and going, bearing in mind everything I know and everything I have at my fingertips, what can I do to make the system better? Um, so I think that's kind of the first thing. And that beginner's mind is something that you'll hear Mark Benioff at Salesforce talk about all the time. And it's what's allowed us not to just keep innovating in an incremental 
improvement way, but to actually pause and reassess and then look at everything that we have and then, and then move forward. And when you do it like that, you still need to then get everybody that you've got um, around you and go, okay, we've got a new plan. Beginner's Mind has delivered this amazing insight. We're going to go now go over there. How do you get everyone to follow you over there? And everybody else is like, hold on a minute. I'm on the other story. I'm going in that direction is a really, really important question. And so we have this process where you have a vision which aligns everyone. What are we going to achieve? Everybody has a vision. Um, and, that, and it starts with a CEO, the vision for the whole company. What are the values then? What matters to you? So at Salesforce, our, our, our values are trust, uh, customer success, innovation, equality. So that then orients people that as we're going in that direction, we must always uh, align to those four kind of cultural values. Methods, how are we going to achieve that? Obstacles, what will prevent us from achieving that? Metrics, how will we know when we've achieved it? And we start, it's kind of a cascade. Everybody in the company, starting with the CEO, we have a vision for the corporation. We sit down with our top leaders and go through this. Is, does this V21 work? We beat it up in management meetings. And then it's good enough. We go, right, that's it. There's no other plan. It's just this V2 mom. And then everybody writes theirs on the back of that in a cascade model. What that does is it, it does ensure that everybody goes in that direction, that everybody has the same values, that the budget, what we, how we spend on our, our money and resources is uh, aligns to that. And if stuff's not on the V2 mom, it doesn't happen. So change the V2 mom or shut up and get on with doing your job in the V2 mom. And that's nice and crisp and clear. And that allows for momentum and efficiency of, of, uh, of effort. That's amazing. I can, I can sense how exciting it must be to have everybody uh, going in, towards that vision and how and achieving that vision makes it uh, more probable. Um, Susan, you mentioned about partners. And so Align 17, number 17 is a nod to partnership for the goals. So the notion that the only way we're gonna achieve the promise of the goals is by working together. I usually in some audiences, when I'm, when I'm more daring, I use the word radical collaboration and uh, just radical thinking, radical collaboration. And I think to Simon's point, you know, new thinking, not trying to um, replicate what people who are dead now uh, taught us. Uh, so how do you see that happening in your space, Susan, that is uh, you're bringing so many actors to the table? What is the thought process that makes that just like Simon has internally in Salesforce, you have across the network of partners and clients and vendors uh, to make things happen? Yeah, and I, I think that the question around partnership often makes you ask that second question around time scale. Um, so uh, sometimes I, I was giving a talk about five years ago um, and we were reflecting on apps and would the, would the iPhone exist in five or 10 years? You know, it was a question and it was uncertain, you know, am I creating an app, right? Um, with this functionality that might be on a platform that fundamentally doesn't exist uh, mm -hmm. in a short time, in a relatively short time period. Um, and so when, when we think of partners, um, you know, I, I often acknowledge the traditional custodians of our land. Um, and that, that is to acknowledge all that has come before us uh, and the people and the communities who have built what we, what we have today. And then to acknowledge the future and that the future is long. Uh, I'm an optimist. I believe that the future is very long um, and, and beyond our imagination for timescale. And so then when we bring it back down to today and the urgency of the challenges that we have, uh, it becomes quite clear that you need to partner to solve this challenge because we are not looking to create change in a blip. Um, some challenges, we hope, fingers crossed, are a blip. COVID is a natural disaster. Um, and uh, it, it will relatively, in, on reflection, be shown as a short one. Uh, the, where we're looking at our climate and, and our biodiverse ecosystems, this is a trend, this is a long-term uh, challenge at the moment and long-term responsibility going into the future to, to live in a sustainable way and, and innovate and have the technology to support restoration of these ecosystems. 
So when we think about partnership, it's very much an acknowledgement of the timeline and then in, the, in terms of capacity. Uh, and so at Dendra Systems, we provide technological services to enable. Our mission is to enable scalable restoration of the natural world. It's not to do scalable restoration of the natural world. Of, of course we do. We have a, an aerial seeding service, which is a drone that goes and plants trees and shrubs and grasses. Um, and so, of course, we're doing it. We have, we have an AI system that goes and analyzes every blade of grass and every animal, every whisker on a, on a kangaroo. Um, but, but really what we're doing is enabling others. And so that, uh, you know, is, is core to, to who we are because when, when we think about this, um, it's at this, there's a hyper-local scale um, where you've got local communities uh, and stakeholders, you've got regulatory bodies, you've got finance groups um, that are all looking to uh, to execute, and we support that as almost uh, an operational intelligence layer. But then, when you look at that even broader scale, uh, you're enabling uh, complete system change, and this is where we've been described as an innovation catalyst. Mm -hmm. So we have we have an innovation, but we're catalyzing innovation around us and that that is in terms of markets that's the way that people think about how to invest in ecosystem restoration how how we think about a sustainable world not just from an environmental perspective but from a financial perspective and so so this is where you've got this hyper local partnership very direct and then you've almost because being an innovation catalyst there's these knock-on effects um, and, and so you require other people or rather other people do <laughs> um, change their behavior. And so we need to consider how are we changing their behavior um, and, and, and their systems by, by what we do. Um, so, so partnership is, is very important to us and, and we, you know, our, you know, contracts might last for five years, but the partnership is really for 20 or 50 years. Uh, in an acknowledgement that that's how long it takes to restore an ecosystem. Um, and, and, and so that, that's the way that I think about partnership. And, uh, and obviously it's critically important because otherwise, A, we might get it all wrong and B, it won't last very long. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, right? The power of words, like how, how the solution changes when you see yourself from you know, doer versus enabler and also kind of the having empathy for the users, having empathy for the others that are coming to the table um, in order to maximize, again, the potential of achieving the mission. And so as I think about the mission that we all have gathered here, people within the World Economic Forum, I understand you personally as well. Um, you know, again, I come back to the SDGs and, and the mission critical that we have uh, together uh, to achieve it. And uh, I understand from your perspective, Simon, that now you're spending something that from a number was kind of shocking that you're spending 75 to 80% of your time um, thinking about uh, sustainability and acting about sustainability and I was just thinking. And so it's, it's a very unusual thing to think uh, because many corporations, right, would imagine or many people would imagine like Salesforce, you know, why is Salesforce thinking about sustainability? And uh, me personally, I think every corporate should be thinking about sustainability uh, if, if it thinks wider and more nuanced. But um, I would love to hear from your perspective, Simon, um, what, is, what are you thinking about? What is Salesforce thinking about? And what does the future look like um, as companies start thinking about sustainability? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a, just a, I think a very, very important subject. It's just something I've been spending a lot of time on recently, um, not least because we have a great partnership with the World Economic Forum. Um, the Uplink platform is built on Salesforce. But maybe more broadly than that, we have, um, we have a, a compelling event of the SDGs pointing to, by 2030, if we have not really got our act together, then two thirds of the biodiversity, the, 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 the natural capital will have been, you know, killed by, by a, a world that is not designed, a business world, which is not designed to fit into this natural world. And, um, and we know that there's this kind of critical issue that we're, that, that we need to address, but, but the world is still marching uh, as business as usual. Um, 
I spend a lot of time focusing on digital transformation, how organizations which are still actually analog by design need to transition, transition to digital. COVID has massively accelerated that. So the logical question is, okay, well, what happens after digital transformation? And it turns out that the next biggest change, probably bigger, much bigger than digital transformation, will be this major shift to what has to be a low carbon economy. If not, then we might as well just forget because there'll be no future story anyway. So there's this big shift to the low carbon economy that has to happen. That is already impacting um, the capital markets. Massive trillions of dollars are already moving towards more sustainable businesses. Unsustainable businesses are already being penalized. Regulatory systems are already pointing to, if not already moving towards um, at least getting companies to, um, to divulge their, their carbon footprint and it'll, it'll go beyond that. Business leaders are already moving in this direction, not just individually, but in groups, the business roundtable, the work the World Economic Forum is doing. There's this major um, revolution that, that is potentially about to happen, but it might not. It could fall flat unless there's real momentum from business. And that's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for all of us. How do we connect the business um, how do we connect sustainability to the growth agenda? And if we get that right, it's a growth uh, opportunity for everyone. So it's natural that we'll be thinking about it. How can we help the world's um, future retailers, bankers, manufacturers, et cetera, become um, sustainable? Because those that don't will be, will, will, won't be relevant in, in the future. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's a, it's a growth opportunity. So that's why we're focusing on it. That's great. And it's and, and one but one very important point, it's the right thing to do as well. Right. That's and it reminds me, um, now that you mentioned about the right thing to do. I remember meeting um Mark Daniels in San Francisco, actually in a YGL summit, and um a Professor Schwab asked him to define leadership. And he said, leadership is love. And it blew everybody's mind, but that's the most succinct is we're doing this and this leadership and business leadership because of love. And that's the why, and, and that's the right thing to do. So we have very few minutes. I, I wish I could stay here. What I would like is, you know, for each one of you. So, you know, what's next? You guys have done, you know, have, have had incredible uh, experience in transformation at the systems level, at the company level, at the global level. Um, how does somebody start? What's the first step? Somebody who just really doesn't see themselves as innovators, as creative, as you know, systems thinker. What would be a first, one recommendation that people can take from uh, from your experience, perhaps? Yeah, I, I love that. I love that question. Because my, you know, uh, firstly, it's just do it. Uh, it's it's that easy. You you're born as an innovator. You you've just got to do it. Um, but something I always like to remind myself, especially um, in conversations like this. Um, it can be very serious, uh, mm. what we're talking about. The importance of the why, very serious. When we talk about the how, it can be very serious. It can be involve regulation, governments, incentives, shareholder action. You know, they can be very serious topics. And for me, the how is so important. Why are we on this earth, right? Why, why do we, what, what's happening for you today? What's happening for you tomorrow? You know, how is so important. And so having fun, I know that it's it's often not something that we talk about, but having fun is important because we are humans. We're not we're not innovation robots. We're not here to innovate. You know, we're we're humans. And and when you talk about love in leadership, it's a very human quality. And having fun is a very human quality. And so I think that for for me, you know, I mean. Our data scientists love playing in our data sets. We have data sets on natural ecosystems that nobody on earth has ever seen before. It's an AI engineer's like playground. You just get to, you get to have fun in it. You're like, look what we can see, you know? Um, and whether it's a snake and trying to figure out, correlate whether, you know, a, a human walked past that snake and how close did they get, you know, it's about having fun. And so when people think about starting innovation, either within a large organization or a government or, or, or starting a startup, um, it's about saying, well, choosing the right topic, the right path of why, choose the right problem. Don't, don't go after a problem um, that is too small. Just be brave, go after a big problem that has meaning. 
Um, and then choose the right people to have fun with and the right solutions to have fun with. I'm an engineer, so of course it's like, yeah, <laughs> let's have fun with this tech. Let's, let's make this uh, an exciting life because it is your life um, that you're committing to. So um, that's, that's my advice is, you know, yeah. choose the right problem and choose the right people to, to have a good time with to solve, solve these big problems. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Simon? Good advice, Susan. Uh, um, I would <clears throat> kind of follow that up by, I don't know why it's important, like be really clear what problem you're trying to solve. Really, really, really clear. Get that, get that right. Um, get the, the narrative in place that describes the problem you're solving, how you're going to do it so that you can communicate it to others and get others to join you on your, on your mission. If you can't articulate it as a compelling narrative, as a story, it'll be hard to do it because you'll just be on your own and then get going tactics drive strategy don't build an all-encompassing highfalutin ta strategy just get going tactic your tactics the feedback you get will drive your next steps that's incredible advice and uh, i need to summarize it but i think everything you have said i it's just wonderful uh, Susan, one of my favorite quotes, and I'm going to butcher it, it says, do not invite me to your revolution if I cannot dance. So I agree with you on the, on the fun part of the creation and playfulness. But to sum it up, basically, I think we all share, and I think the audience obviously share, and anybody who's been around the World Economic Forum like we have been, there's a true sense of urgency, right? This knowledge that there's these challenges, there's a deadline, and it's a possibility, and it's a solution. Um, the solutions exist. We know what we have to do. We need love. We need, we need, you know, obviously innovation, and we just need to get going. Um, I like what you said, Simon. We know the future story, right? So now it's up to us to make sure that it doesn't go the wrong way. Um, having a beginner's mind is crucial. Um, understanding the power of words and how do you see yourself in the innovation chain, so to speak. From, from, from doing to being to enabling to catalyzing. And, uh, and the moment is now. So it is very much a pleasure to have been throughout this whole week with you, Simon and Susan getting ready. And uh, I'm so grateful that you have shared uh, your experiences, your time and your love uh, with all of us today. So thank you so much.